Advisory um, Strategic Dialogue e-forum, which is a series of events which we are, are running uh, online uh, to, fortunately so far, we've had very uh, large audiences and we've had some extremely interesting lectures and, and seminars and debates. And this is the latest in our, in our series of events. So um, a, a, a hearty welcome to everyone. We're glad you can all join us. We hope to have a very interesting discussion this evening. Uh, this evening's theme will be tackling COVID-19, international best practices and paths to the future. And in this event, we will be looking at um, some of the lessons that could be learned, particularly from the uh, responses, the measures taken to combat COVID-19 in, in the United Arab Emirates, of course, the UAE, and also uh, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. And perhaps also we may have time to discuss uh, the cases in some of the uh, East Asian countries. Uh, we will consider tonight themes such as uh, the need to have uh, new measures, enhanced measures to detect COVID-19, um, the applicability, the relevance of IT and big data to uh, track and tackle such pandemics, uh, enhanced pandemic res readiness, uh, and ensuring effective flows of public information. But these, some of the theme, these are some of the themes that we will be tackling. We won't be exclusively dealing with these themes, but I will now introduce, uh, we have two very, very distinguished speakers. Um, um, we have Dr. Victor Cha, who is the Senior Advisor, Career Chair with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the, the very famous and well-known CSIS, uh, which is based, of course, in the United States of America. And we also have with us Dr. Saif al uh, Director of Safety and Prevention NCEMA spokesperson, National Emergency and Crisis Management Authority here in the United Arab Emirates. So uh, I'm very, very happy, delighted that our distinguished speakers have uh, uh, been able to join us. Uh, I would like now to invite Dr. Uh, Chat. I'm gonna ask each speaker to, to, to give their remarks in, in roughly 20 minutes, please, and then once we've had uh, both of the lectures have been uh, have been completed, we will have time for a question and answer session. So, please, uh, Dr. Chair, may may I invite you to make your remarks, please? Thank you very much. Well, well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be speaking to the Trends Research and Advisor E Forum, and, and especially with my distinguished colleague, Mr. Dr. Saif. It's really a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, <clears throat> So I will speak about Korea, but also in my remarks, I'll also branch out a little bit more and talk about other Asian cases, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, it's been pretty clear that the communities in Asia, you know, including South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and even Vietnam have been quite successful in flattening the curve and limiting the spread of the COVID-19 virus among its population. Um, the total number of cases and deaths um, as of mid-April for these five countries, um, despite the relative proximity of human-to-human -human transition with China, is unusually small in comparison with countries like the United States and Italy. Uh, South Korea discovered its first positive case within one day of the United States, but it slowed the infection rate within six weeks. The United States, by contrast, far exceeds 1 million cases today and is still on the incline. Um, Singapore has demonstrated the lowest mortality rate for the virus. Uh, Vietnam has one of the lowest infection rates, despite sharing a land border uh, with China. And all of these societies have managed some degree of normalcy and economic well-being compared with the lockdown and economic freefall in the United States. So what lessons can we learn from these Asian cases from current and future pandemics? Um, I'm going to try to talk about some of the lessons I think we've learned from Asia uh, and, and that could be useful for, the, for dealing with the pandemic or future pandemics around the world. 
So I don't know if any of you uh, on the call have had the chance to travel to Korea recently, but when you deplane at Incheon International Airport in Korea, uh, there is a two and a half hour bus ride that, that awaits you. I'm sorry, a two and a half hour line that you have to wait on to get your body temperature checked. You pass through various checkpoints and you're asked about five times before exiting the baggage claim whether you have downloaded the app on your phone that will track your location. And then once you have reached your destination, you're required to report in the self-diagnosis app every day whether you feel any of the onset symptoms of COVID-19. And if you test positive, your location will then be tracked through the app and others will receive a social distancing alert on their phones of your movements in their proximity. Now most, uh, at least Americans, would chafe at this type of surveillance. Um, Americans see it as contrary to their freedom and values even in these disruptive times. But South Korea has barely over, you know, has barely over just 10,000 people infected by the virus, which is more than 100 times less than the United States number, despite having only one seventh the population. Um, <clears throat> and if you compare like sitting 81 miles off the coast of China uh, is Taiwan, uh, which was predicted to have the second highest COVID importation rate of any country in the world, especially given the millions of travelers that were moving back and forth during Lunar U New Year. Yet by mid-April, it had only 395 cases. Indeed, while Taiwan and Italy identified their first cases in the same week, the latter saw 16,500 deaths, while Taiwan saw only six. Um, <clears throat> And Taiwan has a population not dissimilar to that of, of Australia, and yet Australia is struggling with over 7,000 cases. So my point is that these Asian governments and societies have done something right to enable them to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic much less scathed than the West. And so there have to be lessons to be learned from these experiences for other countries going forward. Um, so the first of these lessons, and I don't think it's one that will be unusual to, to the viewers is that you have to acknowledge the pandemic early and to respond quickly. Um, in, the, um, from, in Korea, from the first detected, detected case on January 20th, it took only nine days before the Korean Center for Disease Control, the KCDC, and the National Health Insurance Service established a National Call Center, a 1339 call center to inform the public and to receive data about cases. Um, 10 days after the first case, the Korean Occupational Safety and Health Agency started supplying over 700,000 masks to vulnerable work workplaces. And two weeks after the first case, COVID-19 test kits capable of producing results in six hours were approved and distributed. Um, the country proceeded to test over 20,000 people daily. Um, for the United States, its first reported COVID-19 case in Washington state came within one day of South Korea. Um, yet, President Moon Jae-in declared a national emergency, which was code red on the infectious disease, disease alert, on February 23rd, about three weeks, and this would be about three weeks before President Trump would do the same thing. Trump has boasted about, uh, about the well over 1 million plus cases, tests conducted in the United States as the most of any country in the world. But I think for any, any, any global citizen, the only metric that really matters for sick people is whether the average citizen, not the president of the United States, can get a test if they want. Uh, and you can in Korea, you can get a test for free uh, using your mobile app on your on your phone, uh, any place you want in Korea, that certainly is not the case today in the United States. Um, the second lesson I think is um, from the Asian cases is that governments listen to their health experts and delegated implementation of response plans to the local levels. However, they also understood that some tasks could only be led at the national level. Um, and nowhere was this more apparent than in the case of face masks. 
South Korea faced the same problem as the United States in terms of an N95 face mask shortage, which led to hoarding behavior and price gouging. On March 5th, the Korean government basically purchased 80% of the national production of masks. They prioritized hospitals for distribution, and then they created a price control and ration system. A mask costs about $1.27, um, and it can be purchased at a pharmacy, a post office, um, or an agricultural cooperative. But to prevent hoarding, citizens were allowed to purchase masks on a designated day based on the last digit of your birth year. So for example, if your birth year ended in zero or in five, then your mask day was Friday. You could go and purchase masks on Friday. Um, in Taiwan, the Central Epidemic Command Center played an active role in resource allocation as well, including setting the price of masks and using government funds and military personnel to increase mask production, such that on January 20th, which was actually the day before Taiwan would discover its first positive COVID case, the CECC announced that the government had under its control a stockpile of 44 million surgical masks, 1.9 million N95 masks, and 1,100 negative pressure isolation rooms. Um, there were, you, you know, we did not see governors, uh, provincial governors, and mayors trying to outbid each other for medical supplies. You know, the differences are quite striking compared with the haphazard U.S. response, where states are fighting with each other over federal stockpiles and over foreign imports of test kits, ventilators, and other medical equipment. Um, um, yeah, um, the governments also, in South Korea, the government also fostered public-private sector partnerships from, for everything from supplies of medical equipment to contact tracing to social distancing. Um, so in South Korea, national health authorities partnered with about 20 medical and pharmaceutical companies to produce test kits. And, in, in, and so the partnership was that the pharmaceutical companies and the medical companies would work on producing test kits and the government would ensure that there would be an expedited regulatory approval regime once these test kits um, uh, came out. Again, this stands in stark contrast to the United States where the CDC, the Center for Disease Control fumbled its first effort to produce test kits, and then the FDA did not expedite the regulatory approval process, losing precious weeks in the national response. Um, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, the government partnered with private sector software developers to develop real-time digital maps of mask stocks at local pharmacies as well as real-time apps to alert citizens to the movements of disembarked passengers from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And in Singapore, government authorities partnered early with private sector business to develop telework plans, as well as providing emergency locations to encourage companies uh, to, do, to adopt split shifts and to do social distancing to limit the contagion. The third uh, core lesson from Asia is the ability of governments and the private sector to fashion innovative responses to the COVID pandemic. Some of the more elegant innovations in Korea have actually been commonsensical ones that have saved lives and slowed the spread. For example, in South Korea, about one month after the first positive case, health officials came up with the simple idea of a drive-through test facility. Um, the first one of these was set up in a parking lot in a university near the, near the hotspot, which was Taegu. And this eventually grew to over 60 facilities nationally that, that allowed for large volume daily testing of thousands in open air spaces, sitting and waiting in their cars that enabled social distancing while patients uh, could simply pull in and then pull out without the danger of, of contagion or contamination. Um, the other simple but pragmatic idea was something called the DS system or the designated system. The government designated which hospital facilities would handle exclusively COVID cases 
and which ones would treat other ailments. Um, um, this information was made available in a phone app and served to reduce the spread of the virus by avoiding the intermingling of COVID afflicted patients with regular patients. And so it, it, if people didn't have a phone app, the other thing they would do, is they, they would place large signs on the front of facilities saying this is a COVID facility or this is a non-COVID facility. And failing that, if people didn't see the signs, they would also have a person standing at the front of the hospital facility in a hazmat suit, basically asking anybody who came in, are you coming in uh, for COVID? Then please come in. Uh, you're coming in for a broken ankle. You can't come to this facility. You should go to this one. And then they would show them where the nearest facility was um, through, through a phone app. So, the, you know, these were innovations, but they were not high-tech innovations. They were very simple, commonsensical, pragmatic innovations that saved lives. I mean, it just saved lives. And again, when you compare it to the United States, it's just, you know, it's very, the U.S., the U.S., on the U.S. side, it's very wanting. But then the innovation that I think has gained the most attention in Asia and perhaps is the more controversial is the use of digital data uh, to socially tag COVID positive cases and to create opportunities for contact tracing and social and social distancing. Um, you know, many, many countries in Asia use some form of this, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, uh, uh, have all used some form of this. Um, and, you know, this practice of digital tracking um, proliferated in Asia, but it has gained less ground in the West um, despite promising technologies that are being developed in places like MIT and large commercial collaborations between the likes of Apple and Google. Uh, controversies over data privacy and distrust of large da data harvesters like Facebook or the U.S. government run rampant in American society so that political leaders reflexively avoid the topic. In fact, there's really a conspicuous absence of discussion about digital tracing in the United States. Uh, when everybody is trying to figure out um, uh, how to do how to do contact tracing, um, it's not just in the U.S. Similar views prevail in Europe, where previous attempts to track influenza in using smartphone apps like FluPhone and InfluenzaNet have met with little success in terms of societal penetration. But Asian societies have been willing to embrace this technology and. and and you know, I want to just spend a few minutes trying to understand why that's the case. Um, so one possible explanation for the for the use of social uh, uh, digital tracking in Asia and, and not in the West, some say is related to regime type that um, non democracies face fewer constraints than democracies in adopting this technology in terms of civil liberties, legislation, and norms of privacy, and that authoritarian regimes don't worry about class action lawsuits filed against them for di digital surveillance. Um, <clears throat> when asked why the United States would not adopt phone app tracking systems used so effectively by South Korea, the administrator for Medicare and Medicaid services, Seema Verma, argued that Korea was not a, quote, free country like the United States. Um, but that's just wrong. <laughs> that's just wrong. Um, first, Aggregate global data of COVID-19 cases shows that regime type does not select for performance in terms of pandemic response. So th those countries that best contain the virus were not weighted towards authoritarianism and those that performed poorly were not weighted towards democracies. Um, um, second, two of the most successful cases of virus containment using digital tracking have been two of Asia's most vibrant democracies and that is Taiwan and South Korea. Um, I'll, let me just talk about, I can talk about both. Let's say, you know, in South Korea, South Korea saw one of the most, one of the most bloodless transitions to, to democracy in 1987. Um, it has direct presidential elections. And in 2017, it actually impeached a democratically elected but corrupt president. And in an orderly, orderly constitutional process, it elected a new president to replace her. Um, and so the notion that South Korea has been successful or willing to use this because it's uh, a non-democracy is just not a real argument. Um, but I think the, perhaps the, 
the most important argument that we should think about in terms of this is um, is the role that um, the role that previous experiences played. <coughs> excuse me, in these Asian societies, when it can't, comes to uh, previous pandemics and the use of digital tracking. For Asia, um, the COVID pandemic was framed in the context of the 2003 Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, and the 2015 Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. Uh, both of these were coronaviruses that caught populations in Asia completely unaware. The hardship, the panic, and the mistakes associated with these experiences had the effect of sensitizing governments and publics to health emergency planning, including streamlined regulatory processes, public health emergency command and control procedures, and changes in domestic legislation regarding privacy and use of data in a way that was completely absent in the West. Um, South Korea's willingness to adopt digital social tagging apps for the COVID-19 pandemic stemmed directly from lessons learned during the mayor's outbreak in 2015. Um, South Korea suffered the largest number of cases outside of Saudi Arabia, uh, 180 cases and 38 deaths. And the government response was not just seen as slow, but the sparsity of test kits, the absence of isolation wards, and the inability to contract, contact trace worsened the situation unnecessarily. Um, patient number one was a 68-year-old businessman who, came, who returned from the Middle East went undiagnosed for several days while visiting four separate health facilities. Uh, and he was the, the original super spreader of the virus in, in Korea. Anyway, after this experience, the country passed the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act in 2015 that required the government to disseminate all relevant information during a public health emergency, uh, permitting health officials to use proactive tracing technology to locate contagious individuals. Um, this included the use of personal data such as GPS data from smartphones, credit cards, and CCTV uh, footage. Um, by contrast, the United States saw only 27 SARS cases in its entire country. It only saw two MERS cases in the entire country. So it barely registered a blip on the national consciousness. Thus, Precautionary, precautionary public health measures put in place in Asia after SARS that were alien to most Westerners became internalized in Asian communities as the new normal. It, the, the Asian so societies just became socialized to these sorts of things. And these were things like ubiquitous hand sanitizers, dispensers in public places, fever monitors at office buildings, antiviral tape on elevator buttons, latex gloves, and of course the use of face masks. Um, um, but in addition to these sort of mitigation efforts, Asia emerged from, emerged from these previous coronaviruses socialized with the expectation that both the public and the government must do much better in terms of distribution of data and information in the next crisis. Um, I went back and read some of the after action reports by ER doctors in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea. Um, and it's really, it's really amazing because many of the things at least we're hearing in the United States today about no personal protective equipment, no face masks, not enough ventilators, not enough uh, isolation wards in emergency rooms, they were, these were all the things that they were saying back then in 2003 and 2015. Um, so there is a, you know, there, there's a lot to be said about the fact that the previous experience in many ways prepared Asia for COVID-19 in a way that the, the United States was not, was not prepared for. Um, so let me conclude by saying, um, um, you know, the United States has bungled several aspects of its early pandemic response. Uh, the United States initially believed that su suspending travel from China and from Europe would be enough to stop the virus from entering the United States, which was wrong. Uh, then test kits produced by the CDC failed, wasting valuable time. 
And then in, in, in a perfect storm, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, did not expedite its regulatory approval process, leaving, leading to even further delays. Um, <clears throat> the most important public good that is provided by Asia's embracing of this digital technology is that society has been to, able to open up, at least partially, and create some semblance of business, of normalcy in business and in life. Cities in Asia are not locked down like in the United States. Tourist attractions are not barren in Asia as they are in Europe. Asians are going about their daily lives, riding public transportation, going to Starbucks, going to work, having picnics, and in South Korea's case, even going to the polls and voting in national elections uh, in April. Um, as restrictions on gatherings get relaxed even further, Asian cities appear equipped appear equipped to manage both the recovery and the possible setbacks that may occur, as we've seen with recent cluster outbreaks in Singapore, uh, <coughs> in Hong Kong, and then just this week in South Korea. In the United States, however, we are only starting to emerge from a 12-week lockdown and are desperate for ways to arrest the country's economic freefall. Um, a, pre a, a prerequisite to even a partial restart of the economy is universal testing, a vaccine, and a comprehensive national contact tracing regime to determine where clusters of outbreaks may emerge. Uh, however, President Trump has said all 325 million Americans would not be tested, and a vaccine will take at least one year to 18 months for clinical trials before it could be brought to market. If that's the case, all we are left with is partial testing and most importantly, contact tracing and social distancing as the only way to contain the spread of the virus. Um, so national, state, and city authorities could follow Asia's lead in leveraging the one piece of technology that every citizen has, and that is a cell phone. Um, availing themselves of this sort of so, uh, digital tracing technology may not be the best option in the West, at the, at the moment, but it may be the least worst choice that we have to make uh, if, we want to, uh, if we want to start to reopen. Um, so let me stop there and, and turn it back to you, Stephen, and to, uh, to my colleague, Dr. Saeed. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Charles. Very, very uh, uh, um, succinct and, and very uh, interesting uh, uh, discussion of, of, of some of the key measures that have been taken. Thank you very much for that. That was, that was very interesting indeed. Um, we'll move on now to our second uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Saif uh, Aldaheri. Um, my apologies, a little earlier, I, was, I, I think I mentioned I was trying to keep you to 20 minutes, but I think Dr. Chair, you took about 25, and Dr. Saif, you have... Um, you have up to 30 minutes because I know you have a presentation which is, should be on the screen now. And please, uh, uh, Dr. Safe, if, you, um, if you'd like to go ahead, please, with your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Thank you, Dr. Victor. An interesting presentation from your side. Uh, delighted to be with you. Um, Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Kareem uh, to all of our audience. Um, uh, we are here today um, along, you know, coming from the trends as an initiatives, um, shedding the lights on the practices of countries that are dealing uh, day by day uh, on a crisis that are global. Um, very new to us. Uh, we are a young country. Uh, we've been through uh, several uh, let's say, pandemic and diseases, uh, H1N1, uh, for the past um, uh, few years that Ansema was uh, established. Uh, but let me, let me start with this, if you allow me, uh, Stephen. I, I, I must say that we're not far from the South Korean approach. Um, we've taken uh, similar uh, policies around our... Um, um, our management uh, approach, and we've we've taken um, what we call the PPA, the proactive and preventive approach. Um, this is just a, a way uh, in really dealing with um, calculated risk. We know a pandemic uh, of a such a global impact will hit 
any, anywhere. You cannot be isolated from the world. You will have positive cases in your country sooner or later. So um, through these policies, um, we tried, um, I, will, I will go through them very quickly. Uh, but let me, let me take you back to January uh, uh, once uh, this was announced that now we have a virus uh, and it's coming from Wuhan city and it's from the Republic of China. We did not, uh, you know, um, just closed everything with uh, our friends in China, uh, but we reduced the number of flights. So we stood up with China and we're continuing to stand up with China. Uh, we know uh, the, the origin of the virus was coming from there, but uh, we wanted this relation also to go beyond um, a such pandemic. Um, so we, uh, we, we only reduces, uh, reduce the number of flights coming from, from China and we uh, put people coming from China through a test, a uh, PCR test. Um, and actually we started with the, uh, with the thermal cameras at the beginning until the PCR test was brought up and the capacity was built around it. Around it. Um, so in, in that time, we started also with the scenario planning back in January 2020. So we, we, because of our experience in H1N1, we said, okay, what if we reach to this number of cases? What's going to happen with our hospital? Uh, there will be any impact on our economy. All of these scenarios were set on the table. So in, in that time, we started also in January 2020. So we, we because of our experience in H1N1, we uh, said, I have, okay, I have an echo. we reach to this number of cases, what's going to happen with our hospital, uh, there will be any impact on our economy. All of these scenarios were set on the table. Uh, Mr. So Stephen, I have an echo coming back to me. In January 2020. So we, we, we... Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear me? Well, sometimes I could hear myself again and again and again. Sorry, that there's some interference, I think. Please, I'm sorry, Dr. Say, please continue. Okay, so um, since then, you know, for the, the 120 days, we, if we talk about four months, we conducted about 500 seniors uh, meeting, high official meetings, 500. Uh, we had about roughly uh, around um, 20 to 30 meetings a week um, looking for, uh, you know, uh, various domain, uh, looking at different uh, level uh, from, um, you know, medical sector all the way to, um, to uh, people uh, brought back uh, from, from other countries, our citizen, for example. So this was a very complex um, operations for us. We should have, and we are until now, looking at multiple domains, okay? So th those came with almost 1,500 circular and a course of action from our operation centers. Imagine 1,500 piece of paper because we wanted course of actions to be taken only for the last 120 days. Let's just give you an impression how serious we were from January until now. Then we, um, we looked at, as Dr. Fe uh, Victor said, social distance, uh, distancing is a solution, at least until the vaccine is available. So what do we do with this? With, with the, uh, in the context of having 200 nationalities within our country. So we have schools, we have public uh, sector, and we have private sector, and so on. So we enforced e-learning, we enforced uh, uh, you know, working from home, we enforced 
so much policies around a social distancing uh, target. Um, then we moved slowly, um, shutting down things. So schools, then malls, then mosques, other religious places, parks, and the uh, list continues. During this policy, shutting down policy, we had to deal, unfortunately, with a lockdown policy. And this came in Dubai, in Naif and Arras area. If you saw the news, this was for one month, a full lockdown of this uh, place. Thousands of people were tested. Thousands of people were monitored. Thousands of people were supplied with medicals, food, and so on. A total lockdown. We never had a situation in our history of such thing, never. A total lockdown. Then um, we had to, you know, we are a federal uh, country. We had to balance. We moved to a strategic balance policy where we don't really close everything. We don't close, um, you know, uh, our economy. Uh, to the maximum, but we allow things to flow at least, to uh, survive and to at least give people the impression that the life is uh, going on, the life is continuing. Um, we're not an island. You, maybe this helps Taiwan, maybe this helps New Zealand. They're isolated, they're, they're in an island, they can manage things around uh, their uh, geographical places. But we, we have neighbors, we have things coming in and out, and we have eight airports, eight international airports. We have ports and so on. So then, um, because of this 200 nationalities and different culture, we moved um, strongly to make sure that we um, have a strong communication policy, a strong communication strategy. How do we really deal with those people? We have laborers, as you know, we have a workforce, we have people from everywhere, 200 nationalities. So we established an initiative called Wakaya. Wakaya is a, a digital platform that talks to the public that answered the public. We have a call center. And we have now, a days, you see the UAE government briefing. Every two days, we have a briefing. And the briefing comes with different theme every once in a while. So to make awareness, to raise awareness for the public, and to make them understand the situation uh, from all angles. Something very new to us, and we are proud of it, is the disinfection program, national disinfection program. We did not have a shutdown, but actually we had a shutdown plus disinfection. So we allow people to stick to their homes, we minimize movement, and we add to it, you know, disinfecting places, park, uh, uh, streets, public places. Um, so we at least sterilize, you know, the impact of the viruses on the public places. Then, um, because also we have, you know, citizen abroad, we have to deal with a situation where countries uh, close their airspace. So we needed to evacuate our citizen not only that, I think this is the same case in South Korea and even different countries as well. We had to also uh, accept requests from other countries, other government to uh, ev evacuate their citizen back to their countries. So that's another recipe to our complex operations. We have to sit down with MOFA IC, 
uh, our uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation to make sure that we look at all these cases and we bring our students, our workers, our visitors, people got stuck for some time. We understand that's a situation and everywhere. So we have to deal with that situation. Sometimes we fly private, uh, private flights to bring one or two people only from a country that is almost closing their uh, uh, airspace. Um, the, and we're, we're, again, we're proud of this. We, we looked at uh, collaboration um, within, you know, our uh, platforms. Um, Dr. Vector talked about, um, you know, the mask, the manufacturing. You've seen, the, you know, the strength of the UAE using technology, whether it's for the e-learning, uh, working from home, and also using the drones sometimes for the disinfection uh, program. Uh, not, uh, not only that, now we have an app like South Korea and other Asian countries and the rest of the world. We have an app called Al Hassan app, and it's based on digital tracing. Um, there is an issue uh, again in the whole world with the digital tracing and uh, contact tracing. Uh, but we're trying to use technology where uh, it is possible to um, uh, maybe assist us to minimize the impact of the positive cases. It's based on Bluetooth technology, uh, as, as you know. Um, as a part of also a commitment to our, um, to the, you know, looking outward, not only inward. The UAE leadership showed us a great example how to assist the whole world. This is a pandemic. This is a global uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we're not immune from the whole world. The whole world has to be immune uh, uh, from this disease. So our, our leaders um, send so much um, medical aids to about 40 to 44, uh, I think, countries so far receiving those aids from the UAE. That's a sign of solidarity, a sign of humani humanity. One other uh, policies we've taken lately is because we're a small country, we have a small population. We don't have so much uh, doctors. We don't have so much medical staff. We launched an initiative called UAE Volunteers. So we called for volunteers. This is very common in, in Asian and the, in the West as well, is to look for people with experience um, to allow them to assist as a part of the social community and responsibility um, to assist our front uh, liners. And Alhamdulillah, we got very good numbers. Uh, people are willing to assist us on, uh, on the, at least the field hospitals and other things as well, disinfection programs and, you know, um, um, uh, food aids, medicine aids, and we're proud of that. This is not only UAE citizen, but this is from everywhere. Uh, citizen and residents of the UAE. Maybe you've seen the news as well from, um, I must, you know, highlight this, the STEM cell experiment. experiment. The, exp the experiment of the STEM cell was outstanding. With the results came positive. 73 COVID patients were treated with this uh, uh, technology. And this was a breakthrough uh, announcement for the UAE, helping the world that there is a, a patent named after the UAE uh, calling for a treatment using the stem cell. Um, then, I should also um, look at um, 
what exactly is, is going on right now in the government domain, the government of the UAE. Right now, we are, um, the government is meeting, high official and seniors are meeting to craft the post strategy of COVID-19. We, as Dr. Vector said, we learn from our lesson. We want to impose those lessons in our new strategies, the upcoming strategy after COVID-19. And this is a vision of a leader, a vision of our leaders that they think that this is the time to gather everyone and sit down and design a strategy that will suit our requirements and it will fill the gaps of what exactly happened on the impact of COVID-19. The whole world looked um, really weak during this crisis and continuing to look weak. And we understand this. Um, but the dynamic that people and the um, both private and public sector showed in the last at least four to five months was outstanding. Now let me move to um, what really made the UAE succeed so far. What are the key success factors? From day one, our, leader, our leadership continually shows full support to the front line from the medical sector as well as in charge authorities managing the crisis. And we are so thankful that we are blessed with such leaders. That's the first and most important uh, factor. The UAE is known for its outstanding national uh, um, once uh, it comes to the tough times. We've been through um, various tough times like um, uh, Gulf War, uh, war H1N1, uh, 2018 financial crisis, and the Yemen war, and lately the COVID-19. So we believe that we as a nation, we come, we will come and we come stronger and more resilient for a brighter future. So our national will is very important. One of the most important factor as well. Then the infrastructure. The ready infrastructure on multiple domain, for example, health sector and technologies and smart government, um, having ANSIMA as a crisis management authority and e-learning as well, and the list continues, all of this canvas the government for a better adaptation in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. We have the infrastructure. That's the most important thing. Imagine about a million and a million and 200,000 students did not have this platform. We would have closed the school and we said no school more. But because of this platform, we could have continued our education journey. That's just an example. We are, uh, we as a nation, we're known as a nation of tolerance and a nation of givings to other, giving to others. We stand by the weaker and we stand high during tough times. We are the home of humanity and we value solidarity. You've seen the students, the Arab students that we brought from Wuhan during the crisis, during the, the first two months of the crisis. We brought around 200 plus people coming from Wuhan and we brought them to the UAE, to Abu Dhabi. That's just showing you how strong we as a nation once it comes to humanity and solidarity. As we speak, as I said, the government is meeting right now, the government of the UAE, and they're crafting the UAE post strategy after COVID-19. Um, some nations are blessed with visionary leaders, and we are among, of, among them. The quest for social distancing 
during the crisis has made us like other go government counts on commitment of our people that we have seen as a result of outstanding commitment according to the latest survey done by the MOI, Ministry of, of Interior, for the disinfection program, 98.2% commitment, 98.2% commitment. This is an outstanding result, ladies and gentlemen. In conclusion, the UAE has proven that, it's, that it has an exceptional model in managing crisis, at least during the COVID-19. If we look at all of these portfolio of policies and we look at looking outward, not only inward. The leaders proved that the world is, um, we, we committed to the world and our visionary leaders prove to the world its commitment to the humanity and its commitment to defeat this enemy, invisible enemy, as President Trump said. We will ensure the safety of our citizen and our resident here in the country, and we will thrive. We will thrive to minimize our losses. And we will definitely optimize on new potential opportunities. And this is going to be within our new post strategy after COVID-19. We believe that we will win this battle and we will come strong out of this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saif. Thank you for your remarks. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to both of our, our distinguished speakers uh, um, uh, for their very insightful presentations. Uh, we do have at least half an hour, quite some time for, for questions and answers. Um, and I think I would, I would like, I mean, the, the, the Two, uh, one aspect from both uh, presentations that um, uh, interested me very much is, is, the, is the importance of, uh, of, of uh, public-private partnerships. And um, this is something I'd, I'd, I'm uh, perhaps uh, speaking from a, a European perspective. I, 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 there's been, there have been some comparisons made um, in the cases of the UK and Germany, for example, where some, pe some people in the UK have suggested that the, the National Health Service is over-centralized, whereas the fact that the, the German system is more devolved, uh, that the states have more autonomy, and there, and there is less um, le the private sector operators are, are given more uh, uh, freedom to... Uh, to operate, uh, um, I think mean, this is a very interesting issue. It seems to me that public-private partnerships are absolutely key to effective responses. It's a case of the public sector, government authorities, or maybe lo more local authorities working effectively with manufacturers of medical equipment and 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 scientific institutes, whoever it may be. The, the, this relationship seems, seems to be crucial. And I'd like to invite both of you to, to comment on that, please. Uh, Dr. Saif, would you like to start first? Or? I'll leave it to Dr. Vector. Uh, Vector, maybe he's... Uh, okay, uh, uh, Dr. Vector, please. Thank you. you. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, so uh, I very much enjoyed the presentation by Dr. Saif. Um, uh, I learned quite a bit about the UAE's response um, from his presentation and uh, very interesting comparisons with uh, Asia. Uh, and also um, things that I think UAE did that Asia did not do that were that were also quite interesting. So, but on the quest, Stephen, on your question of public-private sector, I agree. I mean, I think it's very important. Just uh, objectively speaking, um, you know, um, the private sector as a whole just has they have a lot of capacity, right? Production capacity. Um, they're fairly nimble. Governments are not nimble. Uh, private sector is quite nimble to make changes, um, you know, to adapt production lines or things like that. They're just much more nimble at it. 
and and you know the and and the role of the public sector in that sense is for one to you know to facilitate the legislation that allows for these things to happen and to facilitate any sort of regulatory process and i think um <clears throat> i do think the, the you know the centralization uh for example the national health S service versus other places is is certainly um an important factor but when i look at the asian case and compare it at least to the us the most important factor it was it was um really had to do with the the prior experiences that both the private sector society and government had um in in certain cases but not in, not in others what strikes me about the listening to Dr. Sai's presentation about UAE is that so like Asia UAE had a previous experience right in your case it was H1N1 right and um and you know and then the reality is like in the United States we just didn't have that i mean like i said uh, SARS had there were 27 cases of SARS in the entire country in 2000 27 cases in a population of 350 million and um and mares middle east respiratory syndrome there were two cases in the entire united states um meanwhile you know in asia all over asia people were i mean people were scared because the, there was this virus tearing through the, their society you know hospitals frontline healthcare workers 50% of the sars cases in hong kong were frontline healthcare workers And so they see all these people getting sick they don't know what it is they're not prepared for it. It left a very deep impression just like H1N1 probably left a very deep impression in UAE. And then for that reason you know for the when the next one came around the public sector the government everybody was socialized into understanding we need to do something about that. Uh regardless of what type of government or health system existed um when you compare it to the united states and we just were not prepared just completely unsocialized not prepared at all for this sort of thing and so i think i do think the public private sector partnerships and the ability to work together matter greatly but it's also the socialize socialization that both companies and that governments and public health authorities experienced through through, through the you know previous um um previous experiences with this with different forms of this coronavirus thank you uh, dr say would you yes um it's 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 great to talk about ppp um we in uae have also a, a platform of uh, private hospitals as you know a uh, private hospital is within our um, capability and national resources to deal with the pandemic and that's very important so we have optimized on um a uh, ready a well well established hospital uh, to uh, help us and assist us on testing uh, hospitalization of patients as well and the availability of doctors and nurses so that was very important to to shake hand with private hospitals and private companies to make sure that we have this capacity uh, build up around it we also have uh, you know the pcr pcr testing capacity was also built around having some private hospital to carry some of these tests you've seen the drive through you've seen you know uh, all of these um, uh, capability that the uh, ue have de uh, has designed so it was very important to build on the private hospital the, the the other point is the 3d printing uh, the ue for the last few years is talking about 3d printing 3d printing how do we really utilize such technology for the first time we use the th 3d printing in crisis we use this to print uh, face shields and other medical equipment as 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 well so this is very important to us a technology that we were really investing and talking about for an, uh, the last few years now we are using it in the tough time the other uh, thing also using the factories we have some factories as well that produces medical equipment and ppes so we made sure that those are available as our 
our strategic stockpile uh, from the uh, uh, you know from the resources that we have to uh, uh, combat the uh, the the, um, the uh, disease. The other point and very important is the food, the continuation of supply chain. We are an importer country. We import most of our food from abroad. So we, we had to make sure that the level or the availability and the accessibility of the foods are there. And you've seen maybe at the announcement of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, he said, the medicine and food are untouched. They will be available for inventory. So that's very important to make sure that those strategic direct, uh, directive we implement on, on the ground. The other, the third point was the technology. For example, al Hassan technology and other technology is also, uh, um, you know, um, partnered with other private companies as well. So we used giant companies and strong companies that they have a workable solution to assist us in uh, maybe uh, minimizing the, uh, the impact of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, so using technology was very important to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd, I'd just like to follow up with you, uh, Dr. Saif. If uh, uh, more uh, questions, something obviously you can comment on. Uh, perhaps I think not everyone is aware just how uh, impressive the UAE's testing program has been in terms of the numbers of people per uh, uh, proportionate to the, the population. I think the UAE yes. is the number two or number three in the world in terms number of number three, one point three, almost one point yes. three million. I, I think it's only Iceland and the Faroe Islands that are actually ahead exactly. of the UAE in terms of the. Um, is it is it a, a kind of a, a, a sort of silver bullet, a magic bullet? Could you could you say briefly? I mean, what recommendations would you give to other countries in terms of you want if they want because so many countries are desperately trying now to raise their testing rates? And what would the UAE's advice be briefly? You know, how, how the UAE is a good example. How would how, what's the best way to do it? The best way of do it is to have massive testing. There is no other way of doing this. You cannot rely on thermal cameras. People are uh, uh, symptom, um, they, are, they don't have symptoms, and there are people with symptoms. Sometimes you have an infected patient or infected case that do not, or he doesn't, or she doesn't show any symptoms. So having a massive testing is the only way of knowing the unknown. And this um, uh, virus is invisible. So we, you have to have massive testing. Yeah. And the drive-through, uh, you know, uh, having the drive-through capacity and the capability, uh, um, you know, all around the country was one important approach. The other approach is to focus on area that is congested, especially with labor mm. force. Yes. And was, this was very important to, to us is to allow people to be tested. Now, you, maybe today you've seen the announcement that citizens are now free of charge. They can test yes. free of charge. That's very important uh, also as well. Um, the advice is not to stop testing. South Korea have a great example of testing. They are even on the front line of the race. Um, because of their population, maybe they are not ranked on the top, but they have testing, testing everywhere, everywhere. And this is, we learn from them. We have to understand. You have to understand that we learn from people who are really put their effort on building the capacity of testing. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's in a sense, it's almost like a, a combination of, uh, of, 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 of a voluntary approach and an outreach approach. You make it easy for people to come to be tested, but at the same time you reach out, you target the hot spots, and you you make sure people in in, in those areas are tested. Thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Chad, I think this is more. Uh, 
aimed at you. I, I, of course, we're, we're mainly discussing the UAE and Asian cases, but just going back to the United States, um, uh, I should point out, I, I, I don't want to criticize federations because, of course, the UAE is a federation that's done very well in the current crisis. So Germany is another example. Is it perhaps, a, the, to what extent is a federal structure to what extent has it made the U.S. response so disjointed with the White House trying to, in a sense, devolve the responsibility down to the to the governor, state governors? Is it uh, does it show a, 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 a weakness in in governance for dealing for dealing with with a crisis like this in the United States specifically, but of course compared to other countries as well. I can hear. Uh, yeah, there. Sorry, yeah, I was muted. You're, yeah. you're back with us now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's this is an unusual case because in the past, when we've had crises in the United States and the federal government has been involved, it's usually been something that has involved maybe one or two states. So, like a major flood or you know some natural disaster, where the Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA will come in and they'll work together with one or two governors and city mayors and things. But when a pandemic like this is affecting all states, uh, you know, we've never really seen the, seen the U.S. system tested in this way. And I think in general, the notion that was the sort of idea that was put out by the administration initially was that um, it's, you know, local city mayors and state governors who are on the front lines you know, executing the response, and then the federal government plays a supporting role. And I think as a general rule, that makes sense. That makes sense given the history of the United States, because, you know, the states, you know, um, uh, value their autonomy, right, mm -hmm. in ways. However, th there's a corollary to that statement, which is local, local city mayors and state governors are on the front lines with the federal government supporting and then the corollary is, but there will be certain points when the federal government will need to lead from a front, lead from the front, mm. and not lead from behind. And and I think examples like in UAE or Korea, uh, for example, when it came to uh, PPE, right, and masks and things, you know, that is something when the federal government sees that states are starting to fight with each other over supplies or trying to compete with each other bidding for the import of supplies from other countries, that's when the federal government has to step in, right? And create some sort of system. And, and you know, that was the sec, that piece is the piece that's been missing in the United States. So I think, you know, governors like in New York and New Jersey and California, they have a plan for how they're like, like in New York City, one of the world's hotspots, they have a plan, and Governor Cuomo is out there every day with, with, with data, uh, you know, showing targets on testing, targets on lowering, uh, you know, hospital admittances. Those, those are things that states should do. But there is a larger role that the federal government has to play when it becomes clear that the state system itself cannot handle it. And, and, and so a national testing regime is another example of this, where... Uh, you know, the focus right now is on testing. You know, as Dr. Zayu said, UAE is, what, number three in testing? That's, that's see, that's a fact that I didn't know. I, that, that's very impressive. Um, um, but, you know, in the United States, you know, we have some states that are reopening now, other states that are not reopening, no national testing regime to speak of, not even real benchmarks on testing. You know, you know that's a real problem, right? Um, and so, um, so, you know, I think in... Part of it is the uniqueness of the situation. We've never had really a national crisis that affected all states like this. And then, um, you know, uh, uh, the right idea by the federal government in terms of the role that states should play, but a lack of recognition on the part of the federal government of the need to step in when it's clear that states cannot manage certain aspects of this themselves. Right. And that's when the federal government needs to step in before it was PPE. And right now it's it's testing. All the governors are clearly asking the federal government for help on testing.
Uh, and so the, the federal government in most situations has to step up. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, it's just a, a question for both of you now. I wonder if you had anything more to say about, um, uh, obviously, uh, with the, the, the rollout of, 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 of tracing, there are these concerns about surveillance, um, uh, uh, personal data, um, you know, who would have access to the data of individuals, the concerns about data harvesting, all these privacy issues. Is there anything else you'd like to add to uh, this, this issue of protect privacy? Is that, again, something that requires strong regulation? Uh, does it... Could it be based on sensible public-private partnerships? Could we trust companies to self-regulate to a certain extent? How, how can that be best be managed, this, this privacy issue that, of course, many people are concerned about? Uh, would you like to go first, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Jan? Yeah, okay, please. Sure. Um, so I think, I, mean, there, I think there are sort of three responses. The first is... Um, I do agree that this, as you mentioned earlier, this is something where public and private sector need to work together, right? Um, a lot of these technologies are being developed by the private sector, uh, but when put into use, they will need to be regulated in some fashion by the government when it comes to privacy or other sorts of things. So again, there needs to be a partnership. They need to be working in sync and planning together um, on, on, on things like this. That's the first point. The second is, you know, um, Asia has shown clearly that uh, they're willing to use this technology um, and, and, and with, uh, you know, with a pretty degree, good degree of success. But the tracking technology doesn't work in the overall response unless you have the testing, right? It doesn't work unless you have the testing. So, you know, in the United States, for example, when we contact trace someone who's been um, identified as positive, on average, we are testing about six people around that positive case, right? So six additional people around that positive case. In Korea, if someone tests positive, uh, Korea is testing 45 people around that positive case, right? 45. So that just gives you a sense of what sort, what level of testing you need to be effective uh, with tracing and what level of testing is insufficient. Six people is not sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. 45 people, right? So that's the second one. And then the third point is, yes, there, there clearly are privacy trade-offs. And in a place like the United States where, you know, they religiously guard their privacy, uh, where you have people who are even refused to wear face masks going into going into the supermarket because they see it as a violation of their constitutional rights and things. I mean, it's really can get pretty, it can get pretty extreme in, in the United States. But I think what um, many, and, and you know, what many countries in Asia have recognized is, you know, Asian societies value their privacy too. They don't value their privacy any less than Americans or others. But, um, but I think because of SARS and because of mayors, they understand that there's a trade-off uh, and that this digital tracing does impact privacy. But the trade-off is there's a public good that you provide with digital tracking and with, and, and with contact tracing and testing. And that public good is worth the privacy trade-off. And that public good is things like, I feel like I have control over my life, right? I can now walk out into society and feel like I have some control over my environment because I know, you know, where the positive cases are, or I know, uh, I know where I can go and where I can't go, uh, 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 things of that nature. So, so I think that's, you know, that, that is the trade-off. And then, sorry. And then the fourth point related to that is, um, the societies that have accepted this sort of, and I'm talking, you know, the societies that have ac accepted this sort of digital tracing are also placing a greater degree of trust, civic trust in the government because they are relying on the government 
and the public sector to agree to provide this information about you know who might have tested positive and these sorts of things. And if they believe and trust that information, then they are going to comply, right? Which is to uh, self-regulate in terms of not going where a positive case may be or things of that nature. So, you know, it's so it's there's a lot of pieces that go into the decision to accept this sort of digital tracking that I think we've seen in and it's not just in Asia. That's the other thing. It's like, you know, we're seeing Australia just uh, created a new app, a uh, new phone app, and the government. Um, their goal was to get a million people to, to download the app in the first week because, you know, the idea is if, if you do one of these, create one of these apps and no one, no one downloads it, it's not going to work. So they, they wanted a million people to download it in a week. They got a million people to download it in the first 24 hours, right? And so in France, you know, France is now also experimenting with these uh, digital apps. So, um, um, and, 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 and like Dr. Safe said, if there is, if we want to open up and there is no universal testing regime and there is no vaccine, then all we have is contact tracing, uh, you know, digital tracking, and then something UAE has been very good at, which is disinfecting, right? That's all we have, right? So, uh, and, and, and so we need, we need that sort of technology. We need to leverage that sort of technology absent a vaccine and absent universal testing. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 Dr. Saif? Yeah. Um, I think uh, Dr. Dr. Victor said it all. Um, the debate, the huge debate of privacy breach and tracking, um, uh, you know, is, is, uh, uh, is continuing uh, on the, in the, um, in, in, in all in all levels, you know, uh, we see the you know the partner from uh, between uh, Google and Apple uh, to provide a solution by this month uh, to allow government uh, to use uh, a solution that does not really breach a privacy. We, we are looking forward. However, I just want to take you uh, through uh, uh, Al Hassan app. This is the app. Okay, I will just press my uh, on my name, and you see, as Dr. V uh, Victor said, without having testing, you cannot use an app. You have to have the capability of testing. So you see me now negative. So I have I've done the test two weeks back, and with 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 the uh, you know capability of testing, you can really use the app. Without it, it's almost useless you cannot really get a huge benefit out of the uh, a technology uh, of such. So you must have, you know, the, the uh, new capability of testing plus the technology to allow you to, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, to allow you to lessen maybe the impact of uh, contact from uh, one case to another. Thank you. Thank you. Um, or, can I just yeah, add please, that? So I think... Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, so I think, I mean, that's, I think that's very important. I mean, because, you know, often the conversation is, do you, use, do you use these sort of apps or not, evasion of privacy, but, um, you know, the app doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter if there is no testing regime in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, so, you know, my, I, I, my, I'm a professor at a university in the United States, and we're trying to decide whether we can bring students back to campus you know, there are other schools in the United States that said they will, and they're going to be, do universal testing. They're going to test everybody on campus, faculty, staff, workers, everybody, students, everybody on campus, mm -hmm. which is fine. But if you're, it, you can test everybody, but then if you don't have tracing, it doesn't matter because people from outside the campus will come on campus. And if they infect somebody, you need to have tracking, right? So these things go together, like Dr. Seif said. You have to have them both. You can't have one and not the other. You need both of them for it to be effective. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, we uh, uh, I should just say at this point, uh, we're, we're getting a steady stream of questions coming in. And unfortunately, um, um, we won't be able to get through all of them, but we, we're getting a tremendous response from... Um, from the, the the many the many viewers who are who are listening to our discussion, um, I, I 
there's one major question I wanted to ask just just before I, I go on to my next uh, big picture question, if you like. And just very briefly, Dr. Victor, I'm very interested. You you you, you talked about uh, South Korea and Taiwan, and I wondered if you could just just very briefly. Um, I'm interested in Japan. Everyone seems to be upset in Japan, and there's lots of criticism of the government, but they seem to be doing a pretty good job in keeping the virus in check. I mean, it's it's curious. Japan, uh, the, the, there's been a lot of political controversy and and states of emergency declared and then withdrawn. What, what, any brief comments you have on Japan, the Japanese case? So I think the, the Japanese, I, so I have not included the Japanese case in sort of my studies of the Japanese or the Chinese case in my study of this. Um, the Japanese case largely because there was an additional variable in their response to COVID-19 and that was you know, the fact that they had this whole question of the Olympics hanging in the balance. Of course, yes. Yeah. So, so there, there was a lot of reasons for them not wanting to overreact, um, you know, in early January when everybody started finding out about cases. And I think in a sense that also delayed the Japanese response. Mm. And it was only after the decision to postpone the Olympics to 2021 that we saw, you know, that we see more of a, uh, of reaction on the part of the government and elsewhere, but relatively speaking, given the size of the population, as you said, Stephen, they're not doing, they're not doing badly. Given the proximity to China and the amount of travel between the two countries, mm -hmm. they're not doing badly. But their case is, you know, I think it's different from all the others, just because they had this additional issue of the Olympics, which was, you know, was it hugely important for them, right? It was, mm -hmm. would have been the first time to host the Summer Olympics since 1960, uh, 1964. Right, so it was a big deal for them and a big deal for the Abe for the Abe government. But um, uh, uh, but relatively speaking, now I think you know they're managing it fairly fairly well. Yeah. They also the other thing is they also have a very you know and the cases will they they will we should expect to see more cases in Japan because they you know they're demographically they just have a very old population so they have very a lot of very vulnerable people and a lot of people who ride mass transportation. So. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, the more big picture question I had in mind, I'll move on to is, uh, how can we enhance uh, international cooperation on, on pandemic alerts? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking, of course, of the WHO, the World Health Organization, which is coming for a great deal of criticism from the Trump administration. Uh, do, I, do both of you, do you have any thoughts on you know, could we have better international early warning systems? Is the WHO the right organization to coordinate this? So what, what are your feelings on, on, on better international cooperation generally, on, on dealing with this kind of crisis in the future? Uh, would you like, who would like to go first? Um, do, do, uh, Dr. Dr. Safe, would you like to? Um. This is an, an exceptional uh, crisis. This is um, something that came out of the blue. Um, we've seen, like Mr. Bill Gates was talking about it, uh, you know, also the WHO um, general manager uh, talked about it in 2018 that uh, the uh, readiness of uh, pandemic uh, on, the, uh, on those days to be ready for a strike of such, but we did not expect anything uh, of such an impact. Um, I think the use of uh, technology and the use of information sharing is the only way forward. We cannot uh, do anything of cooperation or collaboration between countries without the use of information. Um, and one important items if you are striked with a pandemic, you cannot be immune. You have to make the whole globe, the whole world immune and vaccinated or at least treated to, um, um, to have maybe a, a, a better uh, you know, uh, uh, environment than having, because we are connected, we are a one world. We have to, we move, we have globalization. We move from one country to another. So you must really, um, uh, maybe treat the whole world in case of such uh, MERS and SARS were different. This virus is completely different than the other two. 
completely different. Um, this will need sometimes, and it, it's a very complex crisis. A crisis, you uh, you know, high level crisis with small crisis within economy, social, you name it. The whole the whole world is really uh, uh, you know imposed to such uh, impact. So the only way I see forward is to use technology, maybe something like you said, Dr. Stephen, uh, early warning system, information sh sharing. Other than that, we cannot do anything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Victor, please. Sure, yeah, I, I would agree. I agree with doc, what Dr. Isai said. You know, I think um, what is so striking about the response to COVID-19 is that there is no multilateral response. Um, that, um, um, you know, when you look at the global financial crisis in 2008, the creation of the G20, um, or even not uh, efforts like that, but even ad hoc multilateral efforts. Um, when I used to work in the US government, we had to deal with the earthquake tsunami in South and Southeast Asia, where um, there wasn't a global response, but a group of countries stepped up, uh, you know, including the United States and Singapore and Canada, Australia, India, and others to, to, to respond to the, to the natural disaster, but then advocate for uh, a region-wide tsunami early warning system. So, um, and, and so what is striking about COVID-19 is that we don't have anything like that now. It's everybody uh, operating for themselves. And two of the most important countries, the United States and China, are only, not only are they not leading, they're arguing with each other about, about this, which is, you know, I mean, from the perspective of international relations, it's the worst possible thing that could happen. So, um, so there do, does need to be some sort of, at, you know, after this, some sort of um, multilateral response. It'd be nice if it were led by uh, some of the big powers, but that, you know, between the United States and China, that might not happen. And there might be a larger role for, you know, for middle powers to play since they have responded fairly well to the pandemic. And maybe it's middle powers that uh, need to get together and do more information sharing and, and talk about best practices and, talk about, um, you know, leveraging technology or, or uh, finding a vaccine, uh, you know, thing, things of this nature, because, you know, there's a vacuum of leadership at the top, you know, with the, with the United States and China right now. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, the, the pandemic has raged across the world like it has. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we're just about getting towards the end of our time, so I'm afraid I'm going to uh, have to start wrapping up what has been an excellent discussion, I think. Uh, I very much hope uh, our, our viewers have enjoyed it. I think it's been a, a very gainful session. We've learned a lot. Um, so I'd like to thank on behalf of Trends Research and Advisory, both of our speakers, Dr. Seifal Taheri and uh, Dr. Victor Cha. But thank you so much for your, for your time uh, and, uh, and, and uh, excellent lectures. Uh, just before we go, I, I, I have to mention uh, Trends Research and Advisory's next online session, uh, which will be on the uh, 20th of May, I believe that's a Wednesday. Um, uh, uh, am I right? Yes, it is on Wednesday. Uh, that will be a session on cyber security crisis management lessons from uh, COVID-19. So uh, that's our next event. Uh, we hope that uh, all of our viewers and more can, can rejoin us next week. Um, thank you once again to our speakers. Uh, I hope um, everyone has enjoyed the session. So all it needs from me now is to say uh, 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 thank you, shukran, um, of course, uh, Ramadan Kareem uh, to all, and uh, and goodbye, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.